Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on the various social media channels we're up on and streaming this episode as it premieres today, and the various either Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, either under El Paso History, El Paso History TV, El Paso History Radio Show, or of course on some of our great partner groups and pages, including the great Facebook group Remember in El Paso When. Today is Saturday, July 29th, and we're talking about the history of weather in the borderland, or at the very least the way that the natural conditions have been measured and changed in their own ways in that measurements and the way it is done over the years. This is, of course, the place where we say Texas history begins in El Paso, and we do have a history moment from Jack, documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk today at the start of Hour 2 uh, this week about El Paso artist Gaspar Enriquez. But joining us here in studio today, we are joined by Jason Laney, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service office in Santa Teresa. So if ever you're looking out uh, towards the mesas, particularly on the west side of El Paso, mm-hmm. and you're seeing that kind of weird little dome thing, you can see it if the conditions are right or if you're high up enough on the mountain there, maybe wondering, the heck is that? I mean, there's some, you know, airport stuff out there, but specifically that dome on top of those uh, large areas. We have a picture of it here available as well. That's where y'all are, and that's where y'all do that very important work for well, tracking the conditions and particularly anything of concern or things that people need to know in our region, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We refer to it as the giant golf ball in the sky. That yeah, uh, sounds about right. The more scientific name would be the Doppler radar, but <laughs> right. both of them work. Okay, and so in that and housed in there is, again, the very important technology that allows y'all at the office and doing that work in there in order to get the data, put it together, and then put on those uh, nifty little maps that help everyone understand, oh, so that's why it's going to rain in my area or why it's going to be as hot as it's going to be in all those kind of conditions. That's part of the technology that y'all use, even though there's a whole lot more into it than just, okay, here's what the dome says. Absolutely. Well, really, the dome is just to look underneath the clouds, sometimes up into the clouds. Okay. But, you know, we can see a cloud from looking from the ground straight up. Sure. But we don't know if that cloud's producing light rain, heavy rain, snow, possibly even a tornado at times with some Mm. circulation. So that's what that radar does for us. It lets us see what is going on within that cloud, what's falling out of that cloud. And if it happens to be going around in circles with some rotation, uh, that's the Doppler side of the radar. Mm -hmm. Uh, Doppler effect. I always tell folks the cool thing about the Doppler effect is because it measures the wavelength that the return comes back to us. And for folks not familiar with that, I always teach it like this. I say, think about a motorcycle coming at you. Mm -hmm. He's going so fast that the sound waves are kind of getting crunched together as the motorcycle comes at you. So it's a very high pitch. And then when the motorcycle passes you by, all of a sudden those sound waves start to spread out because he's getting further and further away from you. And then all of a sudden you get a different tone. So Mm -hmm. I always tell folks it goes like this. Now I hope I don't break the mic. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and, and believe it or not, the radar can tell that right, from some yeah. of the stuff coming down and let us know if the precipitation particles are falling towards us or away from us. And if you get those mm-hmm. side by side, you got some rotation, and then that's when we're going to get busy. Yeah, particularly as you're looking. I mean, there's been a few... A few warnings over that over the years, mm-hmm. at, back in my elementary school days, is one of them, among other things, to date myself. But those kind of things are, are important here. Another way, good way to think about it is, you know, police sirens or any kind of emergency vehicle as it goes by. It has the higher, and then it goes, I mean, it's the same. If you're on board it, it sounds the same throughout, but to the bystander, because, again, the way the sound waves compress or expand then, it just hits differently. And so that technology, the technology based on that phenomenon, is what has allowed there to be the modern forecasting we have, but the history of forecasting and the technology, the way it's been organized, all those things, I mean, both, of course, nationally and then particularly in our region, has had a lot of changes over the years, right? Oh, you you bet. Boy, it started in the infancy. really, really did. Mm. And at the time, we thought we were doing a great job. And now we, now we look back at that. Of course, I can remember a time when we weren't streaming live on the Internet either. So. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the big change that has come in, in a lot of ways, of course. And But making it more accessible and more accurate, particularly because, I mean, 
sure, anyone could go out and say, you know what, it looks cloudy today, or hey, it's sunny out. But then getting that information in aggregate across whole region can be useful to think, okay, how are weather patterns moving? And even then, of course, within that can get even more detailed and more of a, okay, here's what to expect. You start getting into pressure patterns. You start mm-hmm. getting into the way moisture is moving. You start getting to the measurement of you know, El Nino, La Nina, those phenomenons that we've been talking about. Or even as, again, we are recording right now, we're in the midst of the heat wave of 2023 on the 41st day of 100-digit temperatures that we've been seeing in the Borderland region as yeah, we're recording. As we're recording, but I bet the number will go higher before folks hear this. Yep, that's entirely possible. But it's a unique and interesting situation we're in right now. But, of course, this is something that y'all are prepared to deal with and have done other measurements similarly in the past, so we'll get into that as well. So there's a whole lot of detail that goes into this, but when it comes to the way, just even the concept of weather, as opposed to a... You just kind of got to take it and, you know, what you get is what you get. But towards an expectation, a planning aspect of it here, I mean, that comes out of some interesting organization. You got to kind of start nationally, right? The way that it then came to be that, again, besides a, oh, hey, it might be raining today. kind of Absolutely. You know, for the longest, uh, really a lot of the old uh, wives' tales or some, some of the folklore that we hear about weather, You hear them referring to mariners a lot during that, the folks in the Marines. And and that's really where we got to start, believe it or not, because the ship captains, especially out in the Great Lakes area and off the northeast coast and mid-Atlantic seaboard, that's how commerce was taking place back in the day. Things were all being moved by boats. And very important, and, you know, the phrases come to mind, you know, uh, red sun in the morning, sailors take warning, red sun at night, sailors delight, those, those kind of things. Right. Well, for years prior to the 1860s, and I'm going to take you way back to the 1860s. Yeah, sure. I remember it like it was yesterday. No, actually. I oh, don't. my. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank goodness I don't remember it. And you're out well. in the daylight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't tell people my secret. At any rate, uh, over in uh, Sweden and Norway, some meteorologists over mm-hmm. there had really start to put together the pieces of the puzzle based on some observations. Okay. So they could see when the wind would change directions, when the pressure would start to change. And they could conceptualize this in a model. So some of the meteorologists over in the United States started trying this out. And there was one guy. His name was Lapham, I believe. And he was, okay. up in, he was up in the Great Lakes in the early 1860s. And so he started taking a series of observations and plotting them on a map using some of these conceptual models. And he was able to start giving some information to some of the sailors hmm, there okay. about possibly some gales or storms that would happen on that. And he was really the guy who started pushing his local congressman. They did that way back then as well. Oh, sure. And said, mm-hmm. look, we need a better way of observing this stuff because the teletype had come out oh, and over okay. in Great Britain. They had really had some good use of using the teletype to share weather data. Otherwise, here in the United States, the weather data kind of stayed with the person that took the observation and nobody else knew about it. Because it's really getting that information in aggregate because Mm -hmm. there were certain tools that were available. Obviously, thermometer had been – it it existed for uh, quite a long time at that point. But they were also getting tools uh, such as barometers. I mean, there was the old – you can still get the old-fashioned ones about – was it kind of like the the gooseneck bottle of which, you know, how high the water or the fluid within it level is going up as a way to measure atmospheric pressure and had better instruments than that, I'm sure, when you start talking about this beyond the – uh, what you have as a potential decoration in your house into the actual measuring and looking well, you know, at you know, the bars and the formulation of that. So you start being able to combine these types of observations, wind measurements, all the kind of things that you would have on, say, uh, your home weather station mm-hmm. these days. It may not have been digitized, definitely wasn't digitized back then, <laughs> but those types of information was available, but it's really the, the power comes from getting as much data as possible to plug into that model and being able to crunch it, that then makes it more and more useful, right? And and that is exactly what happened. And believe it or not, back at the time, uh, I believe it was uh, President Grant was in Mm -hmm. office. And I'm looking at my date here. You guys have to forgive me as I cheat a little bit and look down because I'm not an encyclopedia. I wish I were. But it was on February 9th, 1870. So it's about Mm -hmm. 10 years after this guy in the Great Lakes started pushing his congressman for this that a bill was introduced and passed, and that was what established what later became the National Weather Service. Mm. But the whole goal was to be able to deploy people to take observations, to share that using this marvelous technology mm. known as the telegraph, and right. then to be able to plot this stuff so we could give very vital weather information and even get some forecast out. So this started to fall under the Department of the Army at the time. 
Hmm, it's a okay. thing called the U.S. Army Signal Service. Right. And uh, part of what they did was they took these observations, and when they thought the weather could be kind of dangerous, well, they hoisted the flags and they put out the signals. Yeah, and so this is a picture of the Signal Service office back in, I believe, uh, 1870 in Washington, D.C. And, yeah, they were using, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways of trying to get information across there. And, again, flags and, you know, not a nautical basis there again in its own way about weather conditions or you know semaphore service but like you said teletype or a telegraph because teletype kind of a direct precursor to the quote-unquote modern uh, fax machine among other things here <laughs> might be a way to put it then there's a, a joke that goes around on the internet about how it would have been possible for a samurai to fax abraham lincoln a message in the times those technology and time frames overlap Technically, though, again, it wasn't exactly a fax machine, even as we know it, for those that do know it. I've had reason to use it and even had a line installed in my house not too long ago. But there's been largely supplanted by emails and more mm -hmm. electronic means these days, though there are still reasons for it to exist, mostly in terms of actually government service. But those technologies, they, they did exist. And again, the intercommunication, telecommunications, mm -hmm. was kind of burgeoning or beginning to start being available. It didn't quite get to the telephone yet, but the ability to send the information through wires over great distances was becoming increasingly available. And again, kind of a key component like you're describing here. Oh, yeah. And this probably could have gotten started a little sooner, but something called the Civil War broke out. Yeah, it kinda, that kind of slowed things down just a little bit. Ever so slight interruption. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we've got a map somewhere that mm -hmm. you've got there that shows one of the early weather maps that oh, was yeah. put out by the Signal Service. And uh, if you'll look on that really close, and this is only for the folks that are obviously watching, sure. but I'll kind of describe what we were looking at, and it's a location of all the observations that were plotted at mm -hmm. one specific time, kind of simultaneous observations. And they generally at that time, and this would be in the 1870s, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, they generally ranged from just west of the Mississippi River and to the east because folks really hadn't migrated that far out to the west. And El Paso, since we're talking El Paso history, was not included on this particular map. Right. But eventually the signal service made their way far enough west into West Texas that we got to be a part of it as well. And it was on November 16th, 1877, that the very first weather observation was taken in El Paso. And okay. it was taken in downtown. The office was located uh, on San Francisco Street between Santa Fe and El Paso. And actually, for the next 65 years, weather observations came directly out of downtown El Paso. Uh, they weren't always from the same building or the same location. Sure. And, and I can't really explain why they moved around so much, but the observations bounced between five or six different locations downtown before it officially all got consolidated out at the airport. I mean, that was, you will call it a decent time of... I mean, upheaval, a, a definitely development in downtown El Paso. So there was a lot of uh, buildings coming and going. I mean, we're talking about spanning the uh, pretty immediately time when the railroad then came in. And so there would have been bigger buildings coming in because eventually uh, one of the places that it was actually based out of uh, some of those measurements were coming out. If we have a picture from that time frame, uh, would have been in the 1920s in the Mills Building, right? Absolutely. And, of course, the Mills Building still stands of there course. right now. Unfortunately, some of the weather instruments aren't there anymore. As a matter of fact, none of them are there yeah, anymore. Fair enough. It's used for other options but uh it's kind of interesting that by the time we moved to the mills building we were no longer part of the uh signal service right mm -hmm. we had become what was known as the u.s weather bureau and that took place in 1890 so we were kind of formed in 1870 right we gave 20 years for the signal service to do this and of course their main job was to take observations mm. and primarily to kind of warn mariners about whether it was coming their way there wasn't a lot of warning for folks that were in the interior and yeah. believe it or mm. not there was a very tragic incident that happened in nebraska in 1888 that really was the precursor to getting the observations out of the signal service and getting real meteorologists to start doing this work with U.S. Weather Bureau. Right, and because, I mean, you can see from that map, as we'll uh, pop up again here right now, it is labeled the War Department Weather Map, the one that is there from, uh, well, from, again, more than 100 years ago at this point. And, again, primarily, basically, I'm going to call it in general, east of the Mississippi. That was where the major measurements, right. where all of the measurements were coming from. And, but, yeah, being a War Department map, yeah, not quite for, or maybe not disseminated as much for civilian use. But, yeah, there's a couple of incidents that come to mind. 
one a little bit closer to home, but we'll talk about the one you were talking about there in Nebraska here in just a minute. Again, if you're just joining us, guest right now is Jason Laney, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service office that is in Santa Teresa now and, of course, covers the whole borderland region. But we'll talk more about that, the history of weather forecasting, and all of the things that they do to still work on these things today. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 
and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however, you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on the various social media channels we're streaming on these days Facebook dot com slash the El Paso History Radio Show, more or less the main one, but also similar pages, other Facebook pages as well, El Paso History, El Paso History Radio, or of course over on the other channels that we're on. But of course, specifically the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook. You can go there for our weekly promo announcements each and every every week on the topics coming up in the coming week. And also our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, where you can find the entire set of El Paso Gold DVD series from Capstone Productions covering at least the last couple of decades of documentary production in and around the region, plus the more recent 20 ABC7 TV series segments from El Paso History TV, focusing on many interesting and different topics. Bernie Sargent in front of the camera. I was behind and doing the production on a lot of those myself, dealing with some of those history topics and important things that, well, trying to put it forth as an introduction for the next generation. Also a reminder to support our advertisers, Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant in Canyon Tio is open for in-house dining, 6761 Donovan Drive. Call Pepe's at 915 877 2152. That's 915 877 2152. It is home of the Juan and only Margarita. And I'll be headed out there after this show concludes airing today here. But of course, still joining us here in studio right now, we do have Jason Laney, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. So, at the point we've gotten to in about the history, about, you know, the early, late 1800s, early 1900s with weather services or what is now the National Weather Service, but the precursors to it present in this region doing their measurements. But it was still kind of insular isn't the right phrase, but it wasn't widely dispersed. This information, the uh, these specific measurements, again, pretty much the whole time and throughout human history, people go out and say, no, oh, you know, it looks sunny out. Mm-hmm. And that would have been the case more often than not, as is always the case here in our region. But getting the specific details had some there was a couple of particular incidents both nationally and more regionally outside of our region really but uh, it, within the state itself that really led to some some big and important changes at that point in time with how that information was handled and disseminated right absolutely keeping and we talked about earlier with the fact that it was the actually the army the signal service right. mm-hmm. that was taking the observations well they they were tasked with sharing some forecast as well but Transmission lines weren't what they are today, so basically what they would do would put together a little bit of a forecast, and they would go tape it up on the front door of the local post office. And unless somebody passed by to take a look at it, nobody really knew what was going on. And, of course, their talent level was limited because the observations were quite limited there. Mm -hmm. So a very tragic thing happened out in the Northern Plains in uh, January of 1888. Mm. The children had all gone off to the schoolhouses, which were kind of remote, far away from home. And back Mm. in that day, the children had to walk to school, in fact. And uh, what happened was during the school day, a big cold front came through and literally turned the rain to snow. And they ended up with an amazing blizzard and snowstorm. Mm. And it trapped the kids in the school. Mm. And, of course, the school didn't have adequate heat, as the homes did. So the children had to find their way home. And many of them actually perished and lost their Ooh, lives. Okay. So they call this the Children's Blizzard mm-hmm. of 1888. And that got the attention of the folks up top in Washington, D.C., where they said, we, we've got to do a little better than this. We, we need to dedicate the real scientists to taking care of this and, and put some more resources to this. So in 1890, it was moved, what was the observation side of things, mm-hmm. the signal service, moved out of the Department of the Army okay. and under the Department of Agriculture because mm, obviously okay. weather had a big impact on agriculture oh, as well. And that was the birth of the Modern Weather Bureau. And there's still a few old-timers around right now mm-hmm. when they say, oh, you work for the Weather Bureau. And I'm like, yeah, I do, but we're called the National the weather, weather Service, service now. now. Yeah. And that's when we got our first official meteorologist here in El Paso to oh, take okay. observations. So they moved him over to the Sheldon Hotel. Huh, and okay. uh, we actually have unearthed some photos, you know, not, not just some artist renderings, but some real photos of this guy at work. Oh, at sure. his office there in the Sheldon Hotel. But his name was Nathan Lane. And mm. I think that's kind of cool because my last name is Lane. Yeah, but I was going to say, any relation? No, not, not, not quite. Not quite, okay. Not, not quite there. 
And he actually took the observations and did some of the local forecasting for us out of the Sheldon Hotel there for about 20 years. Now, he actually had worked with the Signal Service and then the Army before, so he had some experience. He knew what was going on. So that kind of brings it home now with mm -hmm. the Weather Bureau and now meteorologists getting the job done. Here's a look at some of the early observations that were taken right. by the Signal Service. And really, the observations looked a lot like that once they became part of the Weather Bureau. They just didn't have the Department of the Army or the War right. Department on there. Uh, but they were very rudimentary, I tell you. Temperature, a wind measurement, a mm. pressure measurement. And, and the thing is, these things weren't taking at every minute of the day. Oh, no. They were just specific times that were scheduled. Okay, and hey, if the alarm clock didn't go off and Mr. Lane overslept, Sure. Well, sometimes the data didn't quite line up for the early morning temperature. So we kind of questioned some of the low temperatures because the low temperatures were when we mm. thought they would happen and when they would get measured. The same thing goes with the high temperatures in the afternoon. Fair enough. So some of those early readings are probably a little suspect when it comes to quality control as we do it now. But Fair but enough. They're better than nothing. No, it's sure, and it's a record. And interesting parts you can see there as well as in kind of a – so this one uh, dated from the meteorolog meteorological summary from 1889. You can see in that uh, upper corner of it as well that, uh, yeah, taken from the Sheldon block. And rooms 122 and 124, and location of the office of December 31st, 1889. So, yeah, United States Signal Service Meteorological Summary, and then one of the other ones there as well, uh, this one from uh, 1897. Uh, and then under the Department of Agriculture, see that uh, change on the letterhead of the actual of, well, the actual document itself. But now, uh, again, still at the uh, Sheldon Building happening over there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Now, they eventually did move the observations. Mm -hmm. The last observations before we went out to the airport, and we'll have more on that in a little bit, was actually at the courthouse at San Antonio in Kansas. Oh, okay. So we've got a few historic buildings still up and around yeah. downtown El Paso where a lot of the data came from. Now, we're going to relate this to the heat wave in just a little bit. Sure. Now, we've obviously obliterated any of the records they had back then in downtown. Sure. But, but there are people that still question. They say, you always take your data back to the 1800s when you start mm -hmm. talking about records in El Paso. But that data was taken in downtown. It's not even the same location or the same dynamics oh, sure. for where they're taken now. And for a while there, that did leave us kind of in a bit of a lurch because, again, the data quality that we were getting back sure. then. But things like this heat wave and, dare I say, climate change, <laughs> uh, all of the recent heat records we've been breaking, breaking, they didn't come from downtown. Yeah. And, uh, of course, some of the other major things that have happened as a part of the progression. But we'll talk about one of the other kind of major watershed moments of, again, regionally, because we got to take that next break right now, that changed some of the way that data was even gathered or, or dealt with. So we'll talk more about that. But, again, joining us here in studio right now, Jason Laney, warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service there in Santa Teresa, covering the entire borderland region. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break. Here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 
and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free Many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. You can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so. Of course, we have to thank some of our uh, other, well, both focusing on different aspects of El Paso history and uh, promoting it in its own right there, including the great group over at Celebration of Our Mountains. Find them, of course, online at celebrationofourmountains.org, or if that's a little bit too long, just search that in your uh, favorite search engine of choice because they have a lot of different details on things going up. If you missed it, they are doing their monthly socials the last Thursday of each month, so happen on the 27th of this month, but be sure to look for it in the coming month as well. All the details available over on their various social media media pages and of course they're on their main website with the calendar and the events going on including the ones that you'll still have a chance to uh, take advantage of in this particular month uh, they do have the last sunday hike at franklin mountain state park on their calendar so make sure to check that out as well as all of the other upcoming and ongoing events that they have going on there including a lot of events going on at some of the of course local state parks and other things, including uh, coming up on Friday, August 4th, there you got the Solar Cookies event happening at the Tom Mays unit of the Franklin Mountain State Park, as well as uh, campfires and s'mores a little bit later that weekend. Uh, geocaching later in the month, last Sunday hikes as well, Prospect Mine, uh, Lantern Lit Tours, a whole lot of details. Check them out again at their website, uh, celebrationofourmountains.org. And, of course, got to mention some of our other great sponsors of the program, including Economy Wholesale Grocers, Economy Cash and Carry, with two locations in El Paso. 
Paso, uh, 1500 East Paisano, and 411 North Zaragoza. Part of El Paso history in their own right. And again, proud sponsors of the El Paso History Radio Show, EconomyWholesaleGrocers.com. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are, of course, again, joined by uh, Jason Laney, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. And so tracking the history of how weather has been marked and interesting different ways that, of course, it has been measured in the different uh, it, the different aspects of how it's come together. And you mentioned kind of one of those big change moments in terms of how information was disseminated when it came to that with the uh, children's blizzard that you mentioned there uh, toward the end of the 1800s. Then, of course, uh, one of the bigger ones that has at least come up in my mind when it comes to the way not even just information was uh, being disseminated, but how it was even handled and allowed to be gathered and the particularly coordination because, again, the way if you're – just looking at from one point of information, we can gather all you know, a bar- you know, barometer, the different temperatures, what the apparent conditions are, precipitation, wind speed, all of that. But it only really becomes useful if you start looking at the trends, patterns, and all of the information from surrounding areas as much as possible. And that was seen as one of the big failings in the lead up to the well, the information handling at least when it came to the Galveston hurricane of 1900, which I do believe till this day remains one of the deadliest weather events that has ever happened in the continental United States. Oh, yeah, most definitely. And a lot of it was the fact that uh, standing on the shore, when the folks started seeing the storm come their way, it looked like just any other squall or, mm-hmm. or line of thunderstorms had no idea what was really embedded in that. But there had been some clues. They just hadn't been shared. Yeah, there had been clues. And I mean, there is still documentation of the reports that were coming in from, say, Cuba, because it looks like, you know, some of the historical pathing of that actual storm says it went straight over Cuba for the most part. But some of the policies that were in place at the time for the, uh, you know, weather service as it existed at that point was that specifically uh, they were not able to truly incorporate uh, any of the uh, major uh, information bits coming out from international sources, so either from Mexico or from Cuba. And so just to put in perspective what the damage was from that, the death estimates range between six to 12,000. Most end up settling on about 8,000 from this one storm and destroyed about 7,000 buildings in Galveston, including uh, more than 3,500 homes and leaving about 10,000 people of the survivors homeless. And this is out of a town with a population under 40,000, so one in four being left homeless at that point in time by this one storm. And so that led to a lot of further galvanization of, okay, there needs to be different ways this information is being gathered, it's being handled, and certainly the continuation of the ways of which it's being disseminated. Because if you, if you don't have, if you got the information but it's not being used right or not getting in the right hands, it's the question is, why do it? Exactly. And you have to realize weather doesn't just happen in the United States. No, Weather's a worldwide thing and the need to share that information because now we know about the jet stream and all the big no, patterns sure. of everything that's going on out there. So uh, as a result of that, believe it or not, a new organization came into mm. being called the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. Yeah, okay. It still exists today in the United States, the National Weather Service at the time, the Weather Bureau became part of that, and that started opening the doors to sharing a lot of weather information. And what had been happening at this time is folks had been kind of experimenting, saying, you know, we realize that the weather is moving above us and and the the jet stream is moving above us. We need to take some observations of what's going on up top. And and we got some pioneering meteorologists that Mm. decided, hey, you know, we'll get in a hot air balloon and fly up there and chart the weather. And fortunately... That didn't work out really good because of a lack of oxygen and extremely cold temperatures. So we backtracked a little bit. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, during the time of that hurricane, Mm -hmm. we were actually flying kites. Right, yeah. Attaching thermometers to kites and sled and sail. Of course, we needed a good wind. And these were huge box-type kites that you're looking Mm -hmm. at there. And, of course, these came with their own troubles. A big gust of wind. Oh, sure. All of a sudden, it's gone. Worse than that, along comes a lightning strike that strikes it, and it's possible that the person holding the other end of the kite string could be gone. That's a very bad day. Yeah, Yeah, it Mm -hmm. it was pretty rough there. So fortunately, as we noticed with what happened with that Galveston hurricane, we knew we needed more data and better data, but we needed ways of getting it in. And Mm. that's when the precursor to the modern weather balloon actually Mm -hmm. came into play. But that didn't happen until what we're talking on right now, 
kind of came into being. We're talking about radio signals. Ah, of because course. Because of this, no longer did we have to retrieve the weather instrument right. to see mm-hmm. what it read. We could have a radio signal send that information back to us in almost real time. Mm-hmm. And then we started taking some data from that. Believe it or not, that's why the National Weather Service office actually moved out to the airport ah, instead okay. of downtown. Because by the time we had radio signs and weather balloons, we needed a good location to launch them. And just as weather was important for the ships out on the ocean, mm-hmm. they were also important for the planes. And by the 1930s, sure. American Airlines already had a presence right here in El Paso. So believe it or not, the National Weather Service, we kept taking the observations from the courthouse downtown, the surface observations. Sure. But we moved out to the airport to take the upper air observations ah, and okay. start launching weather balloons at the time. And we actually were housed originally in the American Airlines Administration building huh, out okay. there. And if you go to the airport today, there's still some photos of that They're right off to the left before you go through security. Oh, yeah. They've got mm-hmm. all of those great photos. It, it's a great testament to basically our airport, but Actually, the National Weather Service and our weather observations were a big part of that. So, yeah, dealing with in the upper atmosphere because, I mean, wind speeds can be much greater, the, you know, measuring the pressures and the different, you know, types of formation of clouds, all that kind of thing being very important for the accurate, correct, and, you know, trying to give people the best information possible when it comes to what the weather conditions are and the continuation of, you know, like detecting the pressure systems and all of those kind of things becomes very important in that time frame and starting to deal with that. So you started dealing with, again, the balloons, of which we have a uh, much earlier picture of uh, particularly a pilot balloon being tracked with a uh, uh, theolodite, which is a kind of specific type of telescope, basically. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you have to be able to maintain visual contact with it. Believe it or not, even after we moved out to our current observation mm-hmm. site, which is out at the uh, Doniana County Airport in right. Santa Teresa, New Mexico, we were still using that type of technology to really? trace. Because because what we needed to do, even though we were getting the radio signal back, the antenna had to always be pointed at the instrument. Uh, of course. And as the instrument would travel in different directions, if that antenna lost sight of it, we lost the data. Mm, and okay. it got really tough on cloudy days because once the instrument got in the clouds, oh, sure. we had trouble kind of following it. Is really the inv- advent of uh, GPS that helped us get away oh, from that, believe okay. it or not. And even today, things have gotten so advanced that we're no longer even having to rely on the GPS signal to get uh, to trace it. We're sending the signal back through basically shortwave radio, like the ham radio operators oh, are okay. using, and, and bouncing that off some of the local towers. So no, the data is out there, and technology just makes it easier to get good data. And, and radio, and particularly, you know, the ham radio operator, since you mentioned that part there, are also also an important part of gathering the what are the specific area considerations because there's whole, you know, weather nets that come mm-hmm. up whenever we have severe weather in our area and many other places, right? Yeah, the ham radio operators actually were the birth of our Skywarn program, right. which is our storm spotter program. Now everybody can be part of it, but in the early days, they had the means to communicate with right. us. Now that everybody has cell phones and oh, the Internet sure. and social media, we train everybody to be Skywarn spotters. Well, very important information in the way that ends up working here. Again, uh, joining us here in studio right now is Jason Laney, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. We're going to talk more about that technology, its development, and how it's been measured here in the borderland after this next break. So stay tuned for more on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, 
and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, some of the other great people involved in promoting different aspects of El Paso's history, Rick Kern's music podcast, Talk and Rock Radio. Find it online at talkandrockradio.com. That's talk, A-N-D, rock radio. Dot com. Of course, in production for 2023, most recent episode, as we're recording anyway, uh, Taj Ferrant at age 14, the making of a rock and roll prodigy, including previously talking and rocking with Robbie Robinson, Frankie Valley's music director, and a whole lot of different remembrances about different performances, performers, performance spots, and all that kind of the musical history in its own way, particularly during the golden age of rock and roll throughout the borderland. So check them again out, talkandrockradio.com. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we do have uh, Jason Lane. Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. And so we've been talking about, of course, the different ways and technology that has been being used, including those weather 
balloon launches and those changes, but just the places where the actual well, Weather Service, or what has become the National Weather Service office, office was, has changed a bit. Of course, it was at one point there within the Mills buildings, as we have the picture from that point in time, but then was also, of course, at the Sheldon Hotel, even, uh, I believe, prior to that. And we do have, uh, maybe put up the wrong picture earlier, we do have one of the pictures from during that time in the Sheldon showing... Well, that picture, besides being black and white, has some very interesting things, including it looks like that might either be candle or gas lights that are there on the ceiling. So kind of particularly pointing out that point in time. And, of course, what the guys are wearing, those kind of very old uh, starch collared shirts <laughs> kind of thing. So showing them, I mean, some like, you know, instrumentation that's even available there, including it looks similar-ish. Like if you were to look at that piece and see the, you know, the, the cups, the, those uh, half circles on the end of the rods all around a central spindle, people would be pretty easily, I think, if they have any familiarity with it at all, be able to say, oh, yeah, that looks like, you know, a wind speed indicator. Mm -hmm. And so there was similar-ish things being developed, even if the formulization of it was a little bit different. Absolutely. And so we stayed downtown taking observations mm -hmm. even after we moved to the airport. We moved to the oh, airport okay. in 1931, obviously, so we could launch weather balloons. Right. But uh, actually, the National Weather Service or the Weather Bureau at that time, which was part of the Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. eventually got consolidated and brought over into the Department of Commerce. That would have been 1940. So that was about the time, actually it was 1942, a couple of years after okay. we got into the Commerce Department, that we shut down all of the observations in downtown and started consolidating all the observations from the surface, from upper air, and even from some other technologies that were kind of burgeoning at that particular time, including yeah, okay. information coming from pilots who oh, were sure. flying out and flying in to the airport, getting some of that information. So... Modern times at the airport, we've got some photos of those as well. Right, yeah. We started off in the admin building of American Airlines and, and eventually moved over to the admin building there at the airport itself. And finally, we, we actually had three homes at the airport, believe it or not. Hmm, uh, okay. we, we became the National Weather Service and, and moved over into the uh, FAA building in 1970. That's okay. when the name changed from Weather Bureau to National Weather Service and uh, we moved over into that location at the airport. But you can see we had all of our wind vanes and oh, weather sure. vanes. And actually, the one that measures the speed is called an anemometer. Uh, those were right. all located right on top of the tower there, the control tower. So uh, we were kind of feeding that information back into the FAA administration building. And so that's where we worked out of for the longest. And again, another example of the, of the launching of the weather balloons from out there. And that's something that you all still do, not from there or in this exact same method, but it's still a technology and a, a system that you all use to this day, even out at the current office there in, uh, the, off the Mesa in Santa Teresa, right? Absolutely. Uh, we actually send up two a day, believe yeah. it or not. One about 5 o'clock in the morning, one about 5 o'clock in the evening there. Okay. Uh, now, the way the radio transmission works, getting information mm -hmm. back to us, as we've talked about, is much more advanced. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it seems simple uh, because when we first started launching these things, just to have the radio antenna, our radio sons were so large and weighed so much oh, sure. that, that we were really concerned about when these things came crashing back down to earth. So we put, we put parachutes oh, on Yeah, them, that makes sense. Well, now the instrument package is so light that it probably wouldn't do damage at all if it came back down to earth without the help of a parachute. But we still use it just for okay. security's sake. Good idea. As well, uh, I've got a little fact for you here, and I just kind sure. of looked this up uh, earlier. How many different weather balloons do you think we've launched just since we moved out to the new office in Santa Teresa? Well, two a day, and you said you did that in the 70s, so let's call it... Well, well we, we, no, we moved out to Santa Teresa. We haven't even gotten that far in history yet, but we moved out there in 1995. Oh, 1995. There, so, okay. So we're talking, let's call it roughly 30 years. So let's call it thousands. Oh, absolutely, in the thousands. Would you believe, as of yesterday... 20,130 20, scheduled launches, and we've done a lot of ones in between there as well. Wow. Okay. And, and if you take that all the way back to, say, the 1940s when we were launching balloons out at the airport. Sure. 
That's a lot of balloons. That's, that's a, a lot of latex. Yeah, and a lot of <laughs> measurements coming along with it. So that's fascinating in its own right. So again, uh, joining us here in studio right now, uh, Jason Laney, warning a coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service there in Santa Teresa talking more about the current technology, Doppler radar, the advent of radar, and the importance of that in its own right as well. So, And of course, the way it's all been measured here in the borderlands. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break and the top of the hour news here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail, plus the Guadalupe mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's mission trail plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. 
That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free Many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. You can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. 
Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on the various social media channels. We are up on and streaming the video on these days, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch.tv, either under El Paso History Radio Show, El Paso History TV, El Paso History, or Andrew J. Polk. But starting off hour two of the show, as we usually do with a history moment, Moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk talking this week about El Paso noted artist Gaspar Enriquez. Gaspar Enriquez is an American artist known for creating photorealistic portraits primarily of people of Chicano heritage using an airbrush technique. According to the Museum of Art in Las Cruces, Enriquez has been at the forefront of the National Chicano Art Movement for over 50 years, and his realistic portraits show the humanity of the El Paso Chicano community and the tensions they face when living in a two-culture environment. Enriquez's Chicano heritage reflects his life experiences, the urban environment, and the people of his hometown, the museum says. Enriquez was born in 1942 in El Paso, Segundo Barrio. He graduated from the University of Texas at El Paso with a bachelor's degree in arts education. Then he studied metalwork at New Mexico State University and earned a master's degree. His artistic influence includes Mel Casas and Luis Jimenez, both prominent El Paso artists. Enriquez's paintings are usually made with acrylic paint on paper, canvas, or board. His sculptures are made of metal. Enriquez drew inspiration from his students at Bowie High School in El Paso, where he was a teacher from 1971 to 2003. Many of his students served as models for his paintings that are often large in scale. Enriquez divided his work into six categories, depictions of artists, images from the barrio, charro or Mexican rodeo, people with tattoos, sculpture, and public art. Since retiring, Enriquez has continued to concentrate on his art and on restoring historic adobe structures, including the 400-year-old Presidio of San Elizario in El Paso's Mission Valley, where he is creating artist studios. Enriquez's work can be found in public and private collections, including the Smithsonian Institution's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., Cheech Marin's collection of Chicano art at the Cheech Marin Center for Chicano Art, Culture, and Industry in California, and, of course, the El Paso Museum of Art. I'm Jackson Polk with this History Moment for the El Paso History Radio Show. And at this point, we also do like to mention some of our other great partners in promoting and, well, I'm just talking about the history of El Paso in their own right, including the great pa- Facebook group, uh, Barbara Given Bainey, the operator of that group, called Remember in El Paso When. You can go there for archive pictures galore. They have more than 34,000 members as of last check. But please remember, the administrators have worked hard for researching photos with our history attached. They often come up with a lot of interesting different ones. So when others use their photos, they do ask that credit be given to their site. And a lot of credit indeed be given indeed deserving to be given to again chief admin owner and historian barbara given baney affectionately known as bgb along with admins rick duncan rick nahara margaret d smith jim gerber ben vincent and dan graves those last two as moderators as well they all do a lot of great work it's no mean feat to see keep such a large group on task and on track and they do a very good job of it, but they're always looking for a few more good hands or eyeballs. So if you just want to join it or become part of their moderation or administration staff, they're again the Facebook group, Remember in El Paso When, Remember in El Paso When. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are, of course, joined by Jason Laney, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. Thanks for uh, sticking around with us for the second hour of the broadcast here. We're going to talk technology. I had to stick around. Oh, absolutely. So... Let's start with some of the basic definitions here because, okay, particularly from like, you know, news and news weather, the way people see it on, you know, TV or even online these days, there's some people may see the, you know, some people are called, you know, uh, weather casters or, you know, uh, you know, forecast specialists or something like that. And then there are specifically the meteorologists. Correct. So when it comes to, well, essentially the basis for calling yourselves that, I mean, I know that there is a, some level of technology training and, and frankly degree work that goes into having that specific credit, you know, in, you know, accreditation and title with it, right? It does. And, and so much of it is about observations and the technology. And really, in order to even work for the National Weather Service, mm-hmm. if you're a meteorologist, you still have to have the courses in remote sensing. Yeah, and that's okay. a big key one. And by remote sensing, we're not talking about what we've talked about so far. That is taking the weather balloon and sending it up sure. or 
or looking at a thermometer or barometer or an anemometer, any kind of ometer that you can think of out there. Okay. Uh, this is using the new technology, and we're talk- primarily talking about radar and right. satellite. And so radar, so we're, we've been talking about some of these time frames about the movement around there, including from uh, some of the previous locations, such as uh, Shea at the uh, Sheldon Hotel, in which case it would have been primarily some of those, you know, local and, well, the, the mm-hmm. equipment on scene, shall we say, is what they were relying on back at that point. And even then, again, when we're talking about during the move out to the airport then in the 1940s, and again, the weather balloons, like you were talking about, there was some aspect of, I mean, particularly with the weather balloons and the uh, radio communications, the ability to get stuff from not immediately on site, but it was still at that site of where the balloon was. But you start getting into the tech that was then becoming increasingly available, including the stuff that was, well, practically brand new at that point in time. Radar itself was brand spanking new and even the, the cause of some secrecy. So it becoming available out during the, the later 40s at the airport was, was pretty significant. Yeah, it really was. And and actually, the story behind how radar started is, is kind of interesting. Right. Believe it or not, we have to give credit to the Navy for that. Because okay. back during World War II, one of the technologies they were deploying on some of the naval ships were these radar systems. Right. And they were tuned in to have a frequency so they could send out a, basically a radar wave, a radar mm. signal, bounce off incoming or outgoing aircraft, and come back and tell them, where that aircraft was, how many of them there may have been there to kind of help. And so this information was not being shared with anybody. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we were in wartime. It was basically top secret at that point. It was top secret. But in 1946, there was one ship that was out not too far from the Hawaiian Islands that had a thunderstorm coming their way. And whoever the technician was on the ship Mm -hmm. that day responsible for setting what we call the gain on the radar Mm -hmm. had accidentally bumped the knob and turned the gain up really, really high and didn't realize it. So as they're sitting there not thinking there's going to be a threat at all, all of a sudden on the radar comes what appears to be the biggest mass air attack they had ever seen on that radar. Mm -hmm. It turned out they were under attack, but from a common thunderstorm with Mm -hmm. literally millions and millions of raindrops, not thousands of airplanes. And that was when the the light bulb went off and said, hey, you know, we can use these things to kind of track rainfall coming and weather as well. So the next year in 1947, the Navy actually donated 25 of their radars to the Weather Bureau. We didn't get one of the first ones here in El Paso. But it turned out that they were working and working pretty well, so the Weather Bureau Mm -hmm. at that time decided to start investing some money, and sooner or later, these radars were deployed all over the country, including at all the different Weather Bureau offices right here in El Paso happened to be one of them. Yeah, and again, the fact that it was even available at that point, because we're still, you know, the amidst and then, of course, the immediate aftermath of World War II, and it's interesting because the, the advent of it as technology developed primarily by the British, the idea of, yeah, bouncing radio waves as opposed to just a sending or a receiving, but of getting something back from something that wasn't a transmission site on its own, and using that information for war purposes, it was actually a little bit of cloak and dagger. And one of the reasons that there's still that myth that exists to this day about carrots being good for your eyesight, because during the, you know, Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe raids that were happening over, you know, the major cities of London and other places, they were often, you know, of course, sending up the RAF, you know, the famous grass airfields and the uh, gentlemen in their suits and or in their flight suits at that point, waiting, drinking tea, waiting for the alert to come along. And there were, of course, you know, Sensing stations, mostly a listening post that existed all along the British coast to listen for, you know, airplane engines or for their coming along. But then a lot of these attacks were coming at night, making it even more difficult for the to deal with the attacks. But they started being able to intercept them even before they reached the coast over the British Channel and in the North Sea area. And so to try and cover the, for the fact that they literally had a new technology that they were deploying something that it was even in, in airplanes itself as a, are you approaching something? Is there something in front of you? Very, very basic. Not the way we think of radar these days where it's a, oh, here's the point on the map. Go towards that point. It was a, okay, something in that direction. No. Okay. Something's in that direction. Go that way. Kind of thing. Very, very basic direction finding basically. And so the thing they put forth as a bit of propaganda basically on that was, well, we're eating a lot of carrots. Carrots are good for <laughs> night time. There were even propaganda posters being put out there saying, eat your carrots. It'll help with you seeing at night. And that, and there's reasons why, like, even Bugs Bunny at that point in time was then eating carrots, you know, and that is also a, you know, like a, a Cary Grant joke and those kind of things. But 
that's one of the reasons that that is still a myth that exists to this day is eventually essentially being put forth as a okay i mean the luftwaffe was then wondering okay why are we keep getting intercepted at night and so the answer from the british propaganda was carrots but it was essentially a cover for the existence of radar because mm-hmm. back you know late 1930s early 1940s it was a barely nascent technology and top secret and gave them quite the bit of an edge and is arguably one of the reasons that the battle of britain ended with the not invasion of britain itself Mm -hmm. yeah all because of something that we kind of take for granted now everybody looks at the radar on their apps look at the radar you know what does it say and it's it's omnipresent these days (laughs) if you want to find it you you can and at that point it would even knowing the phrase radar could have gotten you at the very least uh, had to have had clearances or gotten you a lot of questions from the people with clearances Absolutely. And believe it or not, in a roundabout way to bring this back to El Paso and some of our history for observations, it's actually the radar itself is the reason why our office eventually left the airport and and came out to Santa Teresa. Now, Mm -hmm. I will explain a little bit about that. It's because of this advent of something called Doppler. And we talked about this in the first hour, how we have are using this shift. Well, those first weather radars that we were using, they were commissioned in 1957. So even though we got the technology from the Navy 10 years early, it took a while to make these things, to conform them for weather service use. And that's what we were using for all of these years. But it didn't have the Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. But in the 60s, they were already investigating Doppler. So the FAA, not necessarily associated with the Weather Bureau at the time. Right. The FAA started to deploy these smaller radars that they called terminal Dopplers, Hmm, and they started using that. And the reason they did that was because they were looking for things like, you know, changing of wind direction and primarily for aircraft. So the FAA was using this and the National Weather Service was using its older technology Mm -hmm. in Doppler. But the thing is, our Doppler radars could go out 180 miles. Sure. For instance, the one that was located in El Paso at the airport there, it could only go as far as the east slopes of the Franklins because oh, sure. the mountains shut it down. Yep. But that termino- that that technology really did play into what we're doing now today. I want to take you back to August 2nd, 1985. It didn't mm-hmm. happen in El Paso, but it did happen here in Texas. That's the famous Delta 191 crash. Mm-hmm. 137 people lost their lives. And, of course, there was no warning at that time about what they were flying into. It was a clear day for the most part, mm-hmm. but they mm-hmm. ran into some wind shear. And by going back and even the National Weather Service looking at their radar and then looking at what they were seeing mm-hmm. on the terminal Doppler said, hey, you know what, you know, this should have been picked up. We should Mm -hmm. have been able to see this. We need more eyes on this. The Weather Service needs eyes on this. And so even though the Weather Service had access to that data because it was so limited to just the airport, National Weather Service was really focused on theirs. But going on in the background here, the National Weather Service had been developing throughout much of the 70s their own Doppler radars, taking Uh, the big radars like the one we have, the real powerful ones with the big reach. Mm -hmm. And, And they were testing these things. And that's when we started realizing we could see tornadoes. They were testing these in Norman, Oklahoma, Uh, right there, you know, Tornado Central at the time. Yeah, Tornado Alley, yeah. In the 1980s, they said, okay, we're going to start deploying these things. So the first ones got commissioned in 1988. So believe it or not, the official name of our radar is the WSR-88D, Weather Service Radar. Okay. Not FAA, it's Weather Service stuff now. And and that, that... that became the big deal. So when we finally got around to putting ours in, which was mm. going to be, we were not first on the list, obviously. It took a while to build these things. Sure. Uh, we were basically the mid-1990s. 1996 is when the radar became operational. Okay. But we realized we couldn't leave it where the old FAA radar was mm. because the mountain got in the way. Oh, of course. So we right. found a nice high area of ground out at the Doña Ana County jet port at the time right and uh, decided to put the radar up and we said well why don't we move our office out there and there was some concern about moving would you believe it was the uh idea of asbestos that finally pushed us out of those old buildings at the airport oh yeah the national weather service and noah said you know since we're already got to build a new radar let's build a new building and move you guys out i mean as as beautiful as the location that is and particularly i mean the the backside of the old airport that you can see there old airport building it's nice and all but it's not uh, nice enough to uh, not say that asbestos (laughs) being in the wall is a therefore just a fine thing 
Yeah, well, I will say that they don't have asbestos at El Paso International Airport now. I don't want sure. anybody to get us confused Again, on that. One. Old buildings. We old buildings that, there, don't, yes. that don't exist anymore. Exactly. But uh, we've since moved out there. But that left a hole, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, who's taken the observations now at the airport if all the meteorologists have oh, now true. left and moved to Santa Teresa? And so this was all part of what we call the modernization. It happened mm -hmm. in the 90s of the National Weather Service. Not only did we have better radar technology we were bringing in, we had better technology to take observations as far as what's called an ASOS, A-S-O-S, -S, mm -hmm. Automated Surface Observation ah, okay. System. Those are now in a play at every airport, every major airport around the United States because Weather conditions are so vital. The most sure. important part of any flight is going to be takeoff and landing. And so you need site-specific information, real time. And so now that we have these things unmanned, 24 hours a day, the right. data is coming in. Now, we'll tell you that we do have what we call a contract observer. Mm. Not quite going all the way back to the days of, of the signal service. Uh -huh. But we do have actually people that are positioned right there they're they're contractors for the national weather service mm -hmm. 24 hours a day taking a look augmenting some of those observations uh, helping okay. out with some of the cloud observations when the rainfall starts when the rainfall stops and even taking the snow measurements when it snows oh, here in the winter okay. time so there's still some human aspect to this but once we got the automated system we were free to move on out to the to the west side and believe it or not what we started doing there changed Prior to that, we really? were we were called a weather service office or WSO. Okay. And what we did is we took observations, we watched radar, and we issued warning. But the forecasts were all coming from centralized, regionalized uh, locations. Okay. Problem with that was somebody in Lubbock trying to make a forecast for the way the winds come off the Franklin Mountains just really wasn't the best thing to do. So part sure. of modernization not only got us the Doppler radars, not only brought in the ASOS as to all the airports mm -hmm. there, it transitioned each and every one of these smaller offices to what they call WFOs or weather forecast offices. Ah, okay. And that has been a game changer for us. Our mission is to protect life and property, obviously, in the yep. face of dangerous weather. Well, who knows local weather better than the local people? Mm. There are now 122 offices around the United States, El Paso being just one of those that actually forecasts the weather, observes the weather, mm -hmm. watches the radar, and, and issues the warnings out there. Yeah, so we'll talk about that and, of course, the impact that you can see directly or hear that even close and including, of course, on our airwaves and other things. But, again, joining us here in the studio right now, Jason Laney, Warning Coordination meteor Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa, continuing on and talking about the history of weather, or at least the measuring of it, in our region. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archive pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA-TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, 
run by Chief Administrator Barbara Givenbaney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archive pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in what is Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Givenbaney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded se- segment and its show on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, a lot of different ways you can interact with the show. We do appreciate all those that are over on our social media, even as we are airing the premieres of each of these pre recorded shows each and every week, letting us know where they're chiming in from and their thoughts on uh, what we're talking about each week. We do appreciate those and do go back and look at them, certainly. And of course, a reminder to support our advertisers, of course, uh, Pepe. New Mexican restaurant in Canyon uh, 67, 6761 Donovan Drive, and of course, Economy Wholesale Grocers with their two locations in El Paso, 1500 East Paisano and 411 North Zaragoza. Do appreciate the advertisers that help keep this focus and the way we are able to do it and talking about El Paso's history each and every week. So please support the advertisers as they support us in that mission and doing all of this. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we do have Jason Laney, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. So we've been talking a lot about the technology, the developments, the changes in the way y'all have been able to measure and do that important and even the forecasting work itself once that came about. And of course, radar has been, I mean, Doppler radar is a very still popular phrase that is used to describe how the weather is being measured and tracked. But some of the other things that are, again, about doing the sensing and tracking of the conditions. I mean, one of the next biggest revolutions that has happened and, of course, affected our region is that of satellites, right? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, that that is still a technology that's getting better, mm-hmm. even in our time right now. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But actually, the first weather satellite was called TIROS, and it was mm-hmm. launched on April 1st, 1960. And what this thing did is it flew at about 500 miles above the surface of the Earth. So it couldn't see a, a large Which, area. I mean, it sounds like a long way away, to be sure, but it's actually 
relatively close, particularly when you compare to things like you know the International Space Station, or particularly when you get to anywhere near geostationary, that's a lot closer than that. Oh yeah, those those are twenty thousand miles or further out into space, so they can see more. But this first one that went up, it actually circled the Earth, but it it would take different patterns. So mm-hmm. what we had to do is we had to collect the information from those, then stitch them together. Right. Of course, by the time it made it all the way around and then it traveled a little to the west, a little to the west of there, the, the, the picture was not perfectly seamless because weather systems had moved, but it was just giving us so much more information than we'd ever seen before. Literally, it's like a camera kind of flying around the earth taking right, pictures. Yeah. But that's when we realized that we needed better technology And uh, there was a famous speech that was given by uh, President Kennedy Mm. where he talked about our space race and Mm. and that we were going to effort to put a man on the moon. What a lot of people don't realize is right after that, his statement was, and we were also going to build the best weather satellites Mm. to help out the Weather Bureau at the time. And so the satellite program continued to grow by leaps and bounds. We got into what you call the geostationary. Right. We call that GOES, Geostationary Orbiting Environmental Satellite. Oh, yeah. If you okay. haven't figured it out yet, National Weather Service, NOAA, we're all about acronyms. Everything is an acronym. A little acronym. bit, yeah. I could get and that. I, I could call you AJP if I wanted to. Sure. And, and, and that, would, that would be just the way we speak in the world of weather. But the idea was we put one satellite, we actually have several of them now, that was further out in space, could see the whole big picture, Mm. and could continuously give us information from the same space. So the reason it's called geostationary, obviously, as the Earth spins, it travels at the same rate as the Earth is spinning. So it's always positioned in the same place. So kind of like the moon is always having the same yeah. face towards us. It's the same thing about, except the satellite is in the same position. Yes. Also, it's not doing the, you know, again, as the ISS does its different laps around mm-hmm. and covering different parts of the globe. This is always looking at the same face of it mm-hmm. in order to, again, not have it be like, oh, well, we've got to wait till the satellite comes back to know what's going on in this region. It's, a, it's always looking right. at this one area. Well, the technology was great, obviously, because now we could see jet streams and weather patterns. And if we'd have had this in the 1900s, we'd have seen that hurricane coming to Galveston, obviously. Mm -hmm. And and it's been wonderful for that. But we knew we needed more data. And so come along the advancements with microwave technology. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another set of satellites that we call polar orbiting satellites Mm -hmm. that do what that first one did. It flies closer to the Earth. And it can sense different types of things, vegetation, all of this stuff from these different radiative transfers that are coming in because it's close and it has these sensors. But again, those have to be positioned and they may only fly over El Paso twice a day, but they're great because they give such a high resolution view to things. Well, back up just about six years ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago, we had the new generation of GOES satellites launched Mm. into Mm -hmm. space. Goes 16 and goes 17, what are called goes east and goes west now. They are oh, using okay. so many more transponders that they are, I like to call it, you know what happened the day that we all got away from tube televisions and we went to high definition flat oh, screens? Sure. Just watching TV was like, wow, we can see all of that. That's what the new satellite oh, does. Really? We use it for tracking wildfires right now. A oh. lot of times, our folks in our office will see a wildfire start from a hot spot even before the Forest Service lays eyes on it to give them right. some information that are out there. It, we're, we're seeing things like changes in vegetation as things, you know, we've obviously had some drought, not drought. No, sure. But sensing temperature of the surface of the earth, of course, we're watching, watching all these things unfold that we never saw before. And not only do they help us forecast the weather, but they really help us save lives. So you put together that Doppler technology right. with these high-definition GOES satellites plus the polar orbiters mixed in around them. It's just amazing. And I've seen so much of this happen just during my career. I mean, yeah, just even the, the this is some pictures from inside the, again, current National yeah. Weather Service office out there. This one being from... Uh, 2003, still seeing a few uh, CR, mostly CRT monitors out there, and then getting more towards as we get to then uh, 2013, a little bit more, a little bit more modern looking, and then finally where you're all now, including having the uh, big board that if people ever <laughs> see y'all's live stream from out there, that they can yep. see all the information up on. So even just the technology in the offices has changed significantly, but of course the way that y'all put it together and use it and have it available to everyone is very significant. So. 
I'll tell you what, we're going to talk more about that, the technology, and the way y'all measuring it, and the way y'all keep those records, and what they kind of show in their own right. So again, joining us here in studio, Jason Laney, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service. Back after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Uh, of course, a lot of ways to interact with the show, including letting us know what you think on the social media, but also you can, of course, uh, send us emails, including to me directly, Andrew Polk at iHeartMedia.com, and some other changes we got coming up on the shows, including we're always appreciating other advertisers wanting to come on board and be a part of this. We also do have some remembrances, and including some uh, passing away of uh, significant contributors and longtime listeners of the show that we will be talking about with some remembrances so check for those on our social postings primarily on our facebook page that's again the el paso history radio show but again joining us here in studio right now uh, we do have again uh, jason laney the warning coordination meteorologist for the national weather service in santa teresa and so of course as we are recording this we are part of what has been refer referred to as a historic heat wave not of course just in our area but across the uh, many states the heat dome how we end up putting it that's uh, affecting uh, many different states, southwest but in, and south in general overall. It kind of seems, at least at this point in time, you're either, okay, do you want to be uh, choking from the wildfire smoke or do you want to be baking in the heat, kind of whether you're north or south in different parts of the U.S. at this point in time. But the way that you all measure that and the way you all deal with it, even though there are some questions from previous eras, shall we say, about uh, the way it was taken and if they were reliable or not in the modern era, particularly with the modern technology and the way you all look at and analyze trends, it's more than just academic. It's more than just a, hey, this was this hot, because like you said, y'all's mission is to make sure that you are dealing with the information and disseminating in such a way in order to help preserve life and property. And that's very much a focus that you all have, even with this current circumstance, right? Oh, most definitely. And, and you know, we talked about the, the importance of observations and mm. through the year collecting all these observations. Well, those observations also feed into computer models that we use right now. And due to high-speed computing technology that came around through the 70s, 80s, oh, of sure. course, mm. now, you know, we have higher-speed computers right here on our cell phones than some of the stuff we were using a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely. It allows us to model the atmosphere and make better forecasts. As a matter of fact, what makes this heat wave stand out so much in my mind? Keep in mind, I've been doing weather for 35 years. Sure. And for 13 of those, I've been doing it right here in the borderland at the National Weather Service in Santa Teresa. The fact that the computer forecast models were so good hmm. and gave us so much confidence, 
that we were able to start messaging this heat event in some cases 48 to 96 hours in advance. Really? Yeah, we're talking two to four days that we knew the heat was coming. And, and that was important because decision makers had time if they needed to go through a little bit of paperwork, if they needed to cross their T's and dot their I's, they weren't chasing the clock to get that done. And that's only because of all the data that has been collected mm-hmm. through the years, the way it's assembled, the way it's computed and put out to us. And that's one of the more important things that we needed to do was let people know. Now, obviously, the other big aspect of this thing it's just how long it has lasted. Right. Again, and the the 40 days plus stretch that we're in currently here. And so it's very interesting that you're talking about particularly the model and the way you're able to. Because, I mean, there's a lot of people thinking, oh, well, does this model good or not? And the way I, I find the most reasonable way to judge that is how useful is it? How predictive is it? How accurate mm-hmm. is it in that? Because the model doesn't give you any of those things. It's pretty useless. So the development of this one and the one you all are looking at and the ability to have these well, these data points come out of it. These predictions is very significant. Oh, it really is. And to be honest with you, what we're doing now is uh, something that's called ensemble modeling because mm-hmm. we realize that, hey, if you put a bad data point into the beginning, you're going to get some bad data at the end. You know, the old sure. adage is garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. Yep. And so we, what we do is we, we run what we call perturbations. In other words, mm-hmm. we kind of change the initial conditions just a little bit, maybe a little here, maybe a little there. And we're actually now using something called a national blend of models that kind of self-corrects itself. We're we're taking the European models. We're taking models from Australia. We're using all the American models, a lot of high-res models that have been – the Navy has their model. We're using that one. And we're running these in different simulations, and we'll come up with 130 different possibilities. Huh. But we start looking at those possibilities, and if those possibilities are all clustered together, if I have 120 out of 130 saying the same thing, guess whose confidence is really, really good? Fair enough. Okay. And that's what we were seeing. We call this the national blend of models. It's, mm. it's the latest uh, modeling technology we're using with NOAA and the National Weather Service. And it has been spot on with this heat wave. And hopefully by the time folks are listening to us or watching us online, uh, the heat wave's beginning to break because that's what the model is saying is going to happen as we head Let's into hope. the weekend and next week. So I hope I didn't make an idiot of myself. <laughs> or at the very least jinx the whole situation. Because, Absolutely. Knock on wood. Yeah, right? exactly. I do that quite a lot these days. <laughs> because, I mean, that's one of the more significant things. And it's not even just, again, academic or a comfort or a, a stay inside it, keep the he- AC up. But well, closer to that last aspect of it, because the way you then again, decision makers, because it may think, OK, what are you going to do? You could tell people it's more hot out and therefore drink more water. But particularly for like vulnerable populations mm-hmm. dealing with and putting out certain things, because there's other things that you also end up modeling beyond just the regional weather, including a phrase that's been getting thrown around a lot lately about the idea of urban heat islands. Mm-hmm. And it is real. It, it, it uh, One of the things that people always tell me, they say, hey, why are you giving me the temperature at the airport? I don't live at the airport. Well, well, that's true, but true. It, we've talked about the importance of having weather data spot on for flights that are coming and going. That's but true. we but we take weather data from all over. We have a set of what we call co-op observers. Mm-hmm. These are people that have been provided high quality instrumentation to take weather data for us across the entire area and that leads to our climate records that we've been using. And some of mm-hmm. these some of these cooperative observers have been serving us for over 40 years here wow. in the local area. And now with new technology, we're gotten into the idea of what we call citizen science. Sure. Just like the folks that are listening to us or watching us right now. They've got these weather instruments in their backyard. They're connected to the Internet, and that information is being disseminated. Believe it or not, we're looking at that data as well. But we did something a couple of years ago, and uh, this was actually granted through the federal government, so it helped out. And they chose El Paso Mm -hmm. of all places to do this. You would expect them to do it. They just had that monster heat wave in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. We knew they were going to go there. But they came to us in El Paso and said, we'd like to do this study. So we picked one day when we knew that we wouldn't have any cloud cover. We would have just sunshine in the air. Okay. And we did it in June, which before this year has always been our hottest month of the year. And what we did is we equipped volunteers with instrumentation to put on their car. And they went out and they drove the roads and the back roads throughout all of the city, even places where we don't have instrumentation right now. Uh, Folks that couldn't get there by car, we put them on bicycles and they rode around and all this data was brought back in. And what we found out was that there is definitely an urban heat island 
Downtown, sure, and some people do live downtown, especially with the revitalization right. that's going on. Mm-hmm. But another real hot spot is right down through the lower valley. Really? And so even though our official temperature at the airport may be reading 102, 103, some of those areas are running five, six, maybe even seven degrees warmer than that. Huh, okay. And so you talked about decision-making. We we've, we've call my title the morning coordination meteorologist, right? So, right. so what, what does he do? Well, we coordinate with decision-makers. Mm-hmm. I take the products that my forecasters are putting out, and I break it down in plain language for people that need to make a decision based off of that. I don't make decisions for them, okay. but I arm them with the information they need. We call it IDSS, or impact-based decision support, because it's all about the impacts. And when you have an extended run of very hot temperatures, Mm -hmm. even though over the past weekend we only warmed to 100 and everybody says, wow, the heat wave broke, down in parts of the lower valley, it didn't break. And we knew Mm -hmm. that was the case. So based on this study, uh, our local office of emergency management, here's a perfect example. They have a threshold that they follow for temperatures. When the temperature reaches a certain threshold for so many days, they'll open up the cooling shelters. Well, those cooling shelters wouldn't have been open half the time that they have this year had it not been for Mm -hmm. their knowledge of where that urban heat island was. And more importantly, they were able to open the cooling shelters in the areas that needed them because Uh, we knew where the most vulnerable population was going to be. So observations, even the simple stuff that we talked about an hour and a half, two hours ago downtown with just the signal service and then the Weather Bureau and the National Weather Service and and even all of that fancy stuff with the new technology we have, it's how we use that data Certainly. that pays off. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really proud to be part of the National Weather Service because we're seeing it pay off right here, right now. Absolutely. So, I mean, there are certain things that are going on with, you know, both the short term and long term. I mean, I know that there's a lot of politics around the phrase climate change. But when you look at it and you see that things change over time, I mean, weather is what you see at the time. Mm -hmm. Climate is weather over time. And so if you see shifts going on with that, there are both, you know, the uh, cycles that happen, El Nino, La Nina, uh, El Nino getting the most of the conversation currently at this point, Mm -hmm. and with the uh, changes in, you know, precipitation and moisture expected along with that. But that is something that you all do chart in order so that decisions, better decisions can be made, right? That's right. And and we chart it from way back in the 1800s when we started taking data locally. And even though the data has gotten a little better and a little more reliable, it's all still still very important for us there. Now, one of the things that that we talk about, and like you said, you don't want to get political here, and and Mm -hmm. we will skip that, is climate change can go two ways. Climate is just, hey, what changed? Weather changes, right? Sure. One day's hot, the next day is cool. Well, the climate changes. One year is warm, one year is not so warm. As a matter of fact, you think about it, when we're comparing these streaks of real, real hot weather, we're comparing them to 1980. Right. That's in third place. 1994, that's in second place. Mm-hmm. And now 2023, which is in first place. But we're in first place for the number of 100-degree days. Believe it or not, mm-hmm. if you go out and average the actual high temperature during those streaks, uh, 1994, I believe it was uh, 106 degrees was the average high. It's 105 right. for us this time around at okay. the airport. And using the same instrumentation in the same location. So it does help us understand a little better, other than just, you know, what do they say? I've heard the old saying that, that uh, figures lie and liars figure, right? And, and they've applied That's that to meteorologists okay. many, many times. But these are things that we're beginning to look at. And sure, we've seen a, an increase in temperatures locally as well as globally, and that's a change. What we're trying to assess now is what the impact is going to be. Sure. Because uh, if, if, you, if you don't apply it to impacts, there's, it's just data at that point. And so that's where the National Weather Service stands on this, is, is finding the climate data, sharing the climate with the folks that will make the decisions. Again, we don't make the decisions. We just help them make the right decision based on the knowledge at hand. And it's been a collective effort through the years, uh, different branches of the government, mm-hmm. and now folks in the public helping us out as well. So, again, joining us here in studio right now, Jason Laney, the warning coordination meteorologist, as he mentioned, with the National Weather Service here in the borderlands, specifically in the office at Santa Teresa. Got to take that next break right now. Coming back from this, we'll break down all the things we've talked about here and uh, uh, close out the show. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, 
Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You're listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free Many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. You can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. 
Thank you all so very much for having joined us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Just a reminder to, of course, also follow along with some of our other great supporters of El Paso History Work. You can find our promo announcements for the shows coming up each and every week in El Paso, Inc. So El Paso, Inc., El Paso's business journal is available for home or business delivery to receive El Paso, Inc. Or get your online subscription. Find them online, of course, at ElPasoInc.com. But again, we've been talking these uh, past couple hours with, again, uh, Jason Laney, the warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service here in the Borderland region and that, that office out there at Santa Teresa. And the differences and the changes that have taken over the technology and the personnel from uh, to the modern office towards going back to, we actually have a newspaper clip of uh, on the one of the vacations being taken, one of the first ones by uh, the first weather observer in El Paso back in 1891, as he was known as uh, Colonel Lane, wasn't actually a commissioned colonel, but that was what he referred to with the, again, the Signal Service and Corps back in the day. The changes that have happened from that point in time and the way that we now do keep things together and hopefully keep people safe, has that those changes have been significant over the years. And, and, and one of the great things about this article, if anybody's watching online, you can't necessarily see the fine mm-hmm. print there, but it, but it really talks about his day. You want to talk about dedication to weather observations and being a pioneer for us. This gentleman got up at 5 o'clock every morning, and he went to work to start taking observations, mm-hmm. rain or shine, cold or heat. He did this up to 15 hours a day, and over the course of 16 years, he had 60 days of leave. <laughs> yeah, 60 mm-hmm. days of leave over 16 years, and we complain about our bosses, right? Right. Uh, he, he had to do The days of leave, most of those were probably related to health issues. He wasn't feeling well, and he just couldn't get in. Yeah. But they left a gap on the days he didn't work. We didn't get weather data kind of coming in there. And so this weather story was just talking about how important he was as a pioneer to local weather observations here in El Paso and, and the dedication that he gave. And, of course, the time changing from that to being just the weather observations with all of the uh, whatever sensors or, you know, different, you know, thermometers, barometers, all those kind of things he had available in his offices at those point in time. So now we're, we're using, you know, the remote sensing, like you said, the Doppler radar, the satellite technology, all of that has made very huge changes in the way weather is even tracked and, of course, recorded in our area, though you do still have some remnants of those old days in your offices, right? We really do now. I don't have the ones that go all the back. To 1891 with Nathan Lane, unfortunately, though those are in other archives somewhere. Sure. But for our office, since we became a weather forecast office or a weather service office, which right. dates back to way back in time, generally like the 1930s and 1940s, mm-hmm. a lot of those manuals we we kept big binders that we would notebooks of sort, sure. hardback covers too, mind you, oh, okay. where we would take the hourly observation hour by hour by hour all day. And what happened about five or six years ago, NOAA and the National Weather Service decided to go paperless as part of the Paperwork Reduction Act. Oh, and so okay. we scanned everything in, we digitized everything, we put it in the cloud, you know, modern technology. Yeah, of course. And, and we love that. It makes it real easy to get back to instead of flipping through all these yeah, books sure. and, and kind of combining the stuff. But when we unearthed these things in a file cabinet somewhere way in the back of the building, they mm-hmm. got transferred over when we moved over in the 1990s. Yeah, right. We asked special permission to hold on to those because of the historical significance. Yeah. And uh, the plan is to keep them there as long as that office exists. Uh, really fun when the youngsters come by for tours of our office to show them the way it used to be done. And, and even some of our new forecasters just coming out of college that mm-hmm. never experienced handwritten observations sure. because the obs are all done remotely now uh, to show them, hey, be glad you got your job now because it was much harder back in the day. Yeah. Now our challenges have changed. It can still be difficult. No, oh, certainly. But, but times have changed. But it all goes back uh, to the whole birth of the National Weather Service. Mm-hmm. We talked about that happening in, what, 1870? Right. 1870 was a birth, and, and by 1877, El Paso was part of the game. We started collecting the data. So we've been a part of this big puzzle for a long, long time, and hopefully we'll be sticking around a little bit longer. Absolutely, and keeping that weather data coming and using it in the way that it needs to be used to making the decisions about how things can, should, or probably need to be working in our area and, of course, beyond there. So, again, joining us here in studio for this show has been Jason Lenny, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service there in San Antonio. So thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak with us about 
all the things, the history behind the local office, the way y'all keep the records, the way the importance of it to this day, and of course, all the stuff that y'all do out there here today. You bet. Thank you for having me on and giving me a platform. I started working on all this data about four years ago for the oh, 150th wow. anniversary of the National Weather Service. I got to talk about it once and the pandemic set in, and, <laughs> and I won't be around oh, when we okay. hit the 200th anniversary. So I appreciate this forum and everybody that's participated with us today. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. And happy to have you on to talk about this. And thank you all for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. We'll do it again next week as we do every Saturday morning, 10 to noon, right here on News Radio 690 KTSM. So until then, until next time, be sure to stay safe out there. Look twice for motorcycles when you're out on the road and have a great weekend, y'all. We'll see you next week.